शिक्षा दीक्षा की परंपरा से आश्रिता हुआ सदा arena it is only possible with a focus on technology based companies that can be scaled up faster the focus on home grown companies would encourage investors to look for enterprises and other consumer brands as the idea is not is to not only increase domestic consumption but also intensify the export activities and rely less on imported products it might be a good idea to back some local brands as they would have some government support as it has announced some major some as it has announced some major soeps for the msmes and for the micro food processing units that would help create small ventures the change in the definition of the msmes also in a way help the startup ecosystem as many of these startups fall under the revenue bracket mentioned under the new definition under the new definition these companies can grow to a specific size without losing their msme tag and benefit vocal for local can create china like startup ecosystem home grown startups companies earlier did not receive any intellectual support and technical know how from the government and hence their growth remain stunted these enterprises or ventures never had any aspiration to grow big or go global but the vocal for local would provide those smaller ventures with that opportunity some of these companies with proper hand holding can become a publicly listed company or get acquired by some bigger international brand thus providing benefit to our country now i would like to introduce our honorable speaker professor katina michael ma'am who is a professor at arizona state university holding a joint appointment in the school for the future of innovation in society and school of computing informatics and decision system engineering She is also the director of Society Policy Engineering Collective (SBEC) and the founding editor in chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society. She is a senior member of the IEEE and a public interest technology advocate who studies the social implications of technology. She is the senior editor of the socio-economic impact section in IEEE Consumer Electronics Magazine. and was the editor in chief of the award winning IEEE Technology and Society magazine in 2019 she took on the role of working group chair 
for the IEEE P two zero eight nine standard. In two thousand seventeen, she received the Brian M O'Connell SSIT Distinguished Service Award. Now, I would like to hand over this mega event to our honorable speaker, Professor Katina Michael Mam, for her golden words and blessings for all of us. Thank you so much, Gulam, and thank you, Akshat, uh, for reaching out to me and uh, inviting me to this wonderful forum, uh, this Vocal for Local Summit uh, for all the young people from the IEEE student brands of Haryana Central University. Welcome to my talk. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here, to be speaking with you. I love it when there are young people coming together to think about their future, but also current things that are happening. How can they support their local community? How can they support their country with innovation? And how can they support with mindful uh, technological um, growth? Very interesting, we had a song or a, or a hymn dedicated to remember your roots. I think it's your university's sort of motto, if I heard correctly. And this is very important, very important in my talk today. Because if we don't remember where we came from, then perhaps we don't know where we're going and why we're going in that direction. And so I second the motto of the university, uh, of your location, because this is very important. This is what's going to tell you where you should be going, how you should be going there, why you should be going there. So if I share my slides with you, uh, and I will do that just now, And uh, let's go to this pack here. I want to basically say to you, today we are going to be discussing what kinds of projects you'll be working on in the near future, even for this particular objective that you identified today as the theme of your coming together. But basically I'm asking you to choose to work on socio-technical projects in the public interest. So while we can have a mindset that says we can create for private enterprise to maximize profit and to maximize sales, I'm going to say to you, I think young people want to maximize projects in the public interest. Young people are very good at looking around and saying, ah, what is the big need in my local community? How can I perhaps ensure sustainability? How can I alleviate hunger and homelessness? How can I bring together some accessibility? How can I offer the one that requires services, services? And so we acknowledge the market forces in an open economy like India and Australia and the US, of course we do. They drive change, but perhaps our mission is to look at our local community be innovative with our business models and not challenge the market forces, redirect them. And so my group on society policy and engineering seeks to look around and say, well, what are the needs of society? And society is very diverse. The stakeholders within society are diverse. The people within society are not homogenous. We have different beliefs. We have different education levels. We have different ethnicities, different religions. All of this difference doesn't mean that there is a shared common interest in the public interest, but the question is where should we, where should we be placing our brain power, our activity? Is it chasing the big transnational companies and saying, look, this is a, a good ride to the West. These transnational corporations are investing in India, are investing in Australia, are investing in the Philippines. Perhaps we utilize them to spread the same kind of technology throughout India. For example, when I worked for Nortel Networks uh, in 1996, the DOT in India was deregulating the Department of Telecommunications and the state circles were all going to deregulation mode. And so there was a lot of activity in India around about the time I joined telecommunications after I graduated from university. And telephony and telecommunications and data transfer is in the public interest. But as we have seen, the internet has been taken over 
by private interests, not public, but private. Individuals, for example, have become mechanisms by which to productize. We have ads that we run, and there's nothing wrong with ads, but the message that things are free on the public internet is not true. So we acknowledge the market forces. We say we are an open economy. We say that we embrace the technology as it's coming into our country. We say that we are lifting the GDP. We say that we are being productive in an economy. But the question is, what projects do our young people like you choose to work on in communities, with communities, to innovate? And I would say we can shift the private interests into the public sphere if we are innovative with our business models. And these are the business models that we have not created yet. So you will say to me, but we are technologists. Katina, how are we going to create innovative business models to serve the public interest? And I don't know the answer to that. All I know is more and more as I speak to young people, they are preoccupied with the future, with sustainability, with achieving the sustainable development goals. They are not so much interested only in profits. Everyone wants to make a profit, particularly when they are working in the public interest. It's a win-win. I'm doing something for the public good. It's technology for good. It's technology for access and equity and universal service. But at the same time, what we are saying is you don't have to be poor if you're working in the public interest. And these are the business models we have to play with. Government has a huge role to play in this. So as technologists, as you're coming up with your new ideas, what I want you to think is how do we implement them? What kinds of business models do we adopt? Okay, a very important message for you because I know you are so inspired by the future. So this is a typical scenario in a classroom, perhaps before COVID hit in February this year, and this is a photo from Code for America. All these young people, their laptops out, just like there's a, you know, Haryana technology conference or a Bangalore technology conclave uh, or a, a, a vocal to local summit like the one we're hosting, people have their laptops open, they have their tablets open, they've got their diaries open, they're brainstorming, they're design thinking. Well, okay, but for what? You see, we are all toiling towards something and there has to be a purpose. Again, I go back to the university's opening motto, remember your roots, remember where you came from. Maybe, just maybe, that will shed some light about how we are to utilize technology. And I want you to embrace this. Don't just think the university came up with a motto just for the sake of it. There's truth in this. And so the values that you espouse in your university should be the values that you roll out in the public interest. So if this was you, and this happens to be, I think, uh, a space at MIT, but if this was you at Haryana Central University, what would you be congregated like this to do? Why? Why are you coding? Why are you going through engineering degrees or technology degrees? Why are you part of IEEE? Ask the fundamental question. Ask your parents. Ask your neighbors. Ask somewhere where you buy a coffee or buy some food. What do you need? What do we need here in Haryana? And they will dictate. You see, we shouldn't be creating and imposing. We should be co-designing with. We should be looking at technical systems as socio-technical systems, not just technologies. And so the public interest here, as defined in Black Law's dictionary, the public interest is anything related to the welfare of the public as opposed to that of a private individual or an organization. It's not about me, 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 me. It's about us. It's about the public. It's about the welfare of the public, the well-being. And all society has a stake. It's not just me who can afford to buy the device. All of us, because we exist, have a right to something, like the air that we breathe and clean air. But what else? Clean drinking water. Yes, but what else? And so there's private, there's public, and there's third sector organizations, and they can work to protect and promote public interest. The public interest is not just the government's job, because the government can't do it by themselves. Government requires private enterprise to work with them 
in public-private partnerships and other third sector organizations like NGOs, non-government organizations and not-for-profits. And at Arizona State University, I've created, uh, with the help of my colleagues, a degree in the Masters of Science program with an emphasis on public interest technology. And this is sort of the, the PowerPoint slide, the diagram that I've come up with to embrace all of these actors, these stakeholders. So if I'm talking about public interest technology, it's technology in the public interest. It has to do with all of society being impacted and perhaps not all at once, but looking at the community needs. And so if I go through this slide just for a moment, we have all of these important elements here like environmental and social justice, equity, justice, fairness, universal services when we're talking about telecommunications or medical um, health technologies. We talk about the environmental, the social, the information access and the accessibility. In this instance, we're talking about governance here, the laws, the regulations, the policies, the guidelines, because technologies don't exist by themselves. They are part of a socio-technical system. And most of these systems in the public interest are open systems. They affect everybody. We are talking about human rights. We are talking about ethics and data security and privacy. And on this side here, we're talking about civil liberties, actionism, lobby groups, advocacy groups, serving others, volunteering in the community, altruistic traits. And here we are talking about what's our responsibility to each other as humans. Uh, how do we ensure accountability? How do we ensure ownership belongs to the right group of people? For example, in the US, we are talking about uh, the running of an internet service by Native Americans and not by a third party, for example, like uh, Google or Comcast. And we are saying, what are the implications of running your own internet service provider, especially when you're such a small player? Will you service the Native American people better? Or, in fact, do we have a model that exists today that's a halfway between Google, maybe, uh, and also a, a public service. I don't know the answer to this, but your generation is going to be trailblazing in this respect. So different types of organizations, and you might be volunteering or serving or an advocate in a different realm of these, public, private sphere, non-government, and public-private partnerships. And here, this is all the technology you're building. This is all the infrastructure, the applications, the end users, how they interact with the smart cities or smart clouds or Internet of Things, whether you're building a safety application, an application or a service to do with education or transport or commerce, entertainment or housing. These are all the things that we choose to apply our skills to. And within this realm, we've got standards and we've got cases and case studies. And as I said before, we don't build for someone, we build with them. We bring them along in the design process. So if we look to a definition by New America, what is public interest technology? Another definition, public interest technology is a field dedicated to leveraging technology to support public interest organizations and the people that they serve. So think about technologies that you might be able to build that allow for organizations who want to work in the public interest to leverage your tools to do something in the community. For example, how do you survey a community? Are there tools to do that? How do you gain public sentiment? Are there tools to do this? How do you ensure an open democracy? What kinds of tools do you use to do this? How can you ensure crowdsourcing and that data remains private and is de-identified? Okay, you need tools. And so what we're talking about is the, in public interest tech is the building of platforms, socio-technical platforms, on which different players can play. Think about it as a big board game or a, or a big online software game. And on the board game, okay, are all these different players. Think of Monopoly. But it's not just monopoly for the renting of houses. You're talking about um, a government agency being on the board. And you, when, you, when you roll on that 
that square, you ask the question, do we have clean drinking water? And think about the 17 sustainable development goals, and that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about when public interest technology. How do you build tools and services that actually help us by 2030 to satisfy the SDGs and all their hundreds of sub goals? So think innovatively, think local. This is why you're doing this activity. But then when you build for the local instance, are these technologies extensible to the rest of your state, extensible to the rest of your country, extensible to the rest of the world? And friends, the big thing is, in order for you to build these tools, because I know you can, the question is how you're going to monetize to keep your operation going. There are venture capitalists that look at these kinds of technologies. Increasingly, there are. There may be funding from private investors. But think about who will sustain these platforms that I'm encouraging you to build. The great uh, security scholar Pub, uh, Bruce Schneier uh, has created the website public-interest-tech.com and he spoke at ISTAS 20 a few days ago and he introduced himself as a public interest technologist. And many of you may not know that this role exists. You know, you hear about the roles of an engineer, a sales engineer, a business developer, a product um, roadmap um, developer. Um, all of these different roles, a software developer, um, a systems integrator, right? All of these different roles. And now we're starting to see the, the term public interest technologist. So imagine you went up to someone, what are you? You know, this will, this will shock them, friends. And you say, yeah, I'm an engineer, or I'm studying to be an electrical engineer, or a civil engineer, or a mechanical engineer, or a mechatronic engineer, or a biomedical engineer. But what if you then said to them, I do engineering in the public interest. I'm a public interest technologist. And in the States, probably about nine months ago, we started to see this um, surface into public speak when somebody was asked, what are you? And Bruce Schneier responded in 2019, I'm a public interest technologist. Think about that for a second. This, you can be anything in STEM, but the public interest basically focuses on the public and not me or the private individual who can afford. And so, was public interest technology already happening 40, 50 years ago? We can say that it was, but it wasn't very prestigious to work in the public interest. It, it was more prestigious to work for private companies like IBM. But even today, companies like IBM, I listened to the CISO of IBM uh, last November uh, at the NICE conference, and she was saying how much she is embracing public interest technology, that security requires specialists that are non-traditional. The public interest technology will draw cross-disciplinary skill sets, not just silos. And she was saying we need people from different backgrounds in order to enrich us so that we know we are dealing with diverse levels of thinking. If you, if you hired 10 security specialists, at the same time, at the same level, they're going to tell you the, the same 10 things because they've been uh, taught a certain way. So the question then becomes, how do we encourage public interest technology to occur in organizations that serve the public, in organizations that are private as well? Is tomorrow Google going to announce a whole bunch of public interest technology posts? and? Watch this space, friends. I think they may well. And this is more than responsible innovation. This is more than uh, ensuring content and appropriate content. This is much bigger an agenda. And rather than it being seen as a technology, what is public interest tech? It's an ideology. In fact, yesterday we were in a colloquium. Someone called it a social movement. People that embrace public interest technology are embracing a social movement where we say we've had enough of... Uh, our private data being scraped or companies web scraping stuff or the internet being misused by private enterprise to trace where we're going, what we're doing and surveil us in our everyday transactions. So PIT is 
very much encouraging, not only in the private sector, but of volunteerism. So if you say you're a public interest technologist, most likely you're doing a lot of volunteer work. You could be doing archival work. You could be volunteering at a local company or a local museum that doesn't have the resources or the funding to see things through. And I'm going to encourage you that if you're going to talk about the uh, vocal to local summit, a lot of this has to be about volunteerism. And this also helps you to develop skill sets, right? It's not like you have internships by the time you come out of university. It's fantastic if you do. But I want to encourage you to look at volunteerism as a way to gain exposure and experience and perhaps to make this your full-time work in the future in a paid capacity. So public interest technology is a philosophy. It's interdisciplinary pedagogy. It's about ethics for professional behavior in the workplace. It's a sector of employment. And it includes scientists, engineers, policymakers, corporate leaders, field experts, activists, and much more. So because technology is becoming increasingly integral in our lives, it also becomes intertwined with the public interest. I know a lot of people would have thought maybe 30 years ago that they wouldn't be carrying one of these handsets. But this private technology that I could afford with my credit card and my ongoing prepaid service, that has now become intertwined with the public interest. The internet was a public interest good. It became privatized much of the way through. And now we're trying to unravel and step back. Tim Berners-Lee's always talks about unraveling and becoming more public and, and the internet returning to what it was there to serve in the beginning. The public sector is lagging behind in technological ability. Sometimes this leads to distrust when government applications fail or there's a data breach. But how can we reinstate faith in the public sector? It is through public interest technologies. It's about civic operations and making them better. It's about services becoming better in your local community. So the public interest for technology, protecting the rights of citizens in the face of emerging tech, and it's designing tech with human beings to meet their needs. So an exercise I ran in my group, we all got sticky notes. We put them up on the board, nine researchers, full-time researchers, and the rest student participants. And we said, what are we about as public interest technologists? And you can see here, we are about knowledge creation, justice, both environmental and social. We're about community, we're about technology and activism, volunteerism, governance, futures, security, mindfulness, democracy, participation, accountability. So if you go back to my, my big chart, where I show a lot of these words in sort of like a, a big diagram. This is the word cloud of that big diagram. That big diagram was driven by this activity. And the group has done this every 12 months to see what has changed. And the calibration between one year and the next is remarkable. So we know what we stand for as a group. And I'm sure the students also know what they stand for. So this is our degree program website. And the question that it's open to is, is technology being applied for the public good? And you see terms like innovation, emerging technology, environmental impact, justice, social responsibility flagged there. And the career outcomes are these. You know, if you go for a degree in public interest technology or you wanna start calling yourself a public interest technologist, what kinds of areas of expertise might you join? What are your career aspirations? Well, you can be an analyst and a designer, a planner and a solutions advisor, an advocacy coordinator, a communications and outreach officer, a technology impact assessment advisor, standards <coughs> coordinator, child rights campaigner, public health policy, public policy analyst, data privacy, integrity, trust and safety officer, environmental affairs manager and human rights officer, and many more. For example, user experience designer. What we found, friends, is that many of these titles actually 
were being advertised by companies like Google and Facebook. So why now? Why are people beginning to talk about public interest technology? Why now? It's 2020. Well, they started talking about it quite a while ago. It used to be called, for example, within IEEE, the Society on the Social Implications of Technology. But public interest tech is not really just about social implications, right? It's about understanding technology within a context of the public. And students would love to be engaged in building shiny gadgets, but I think students and young people look around them and their eyes lit, light up and they think about how can they perform positive change. So I want you to stop for a moment thinking technology is a shiny black box like this, right? Shiny black box. And I want you to start thinking about technology as a process. It's nice when the process comes out with a technology like this. It looks very nice and it's very friendly, very usable. It helps us to do great things like keep in touch with one another, even when we are remote. Now we have data uh, applications. But I want you to start thinking deeper. Coordination. Understanding value chains. Understanding vulnerability within your critical infrastructure. Looking at how you can boost education levels. Technology in education. And I don't mean apps that the students download to read their, their textbook. That's not what I'm saying. Think deeper. How do we create an environment, an ecosystem, as was mentioned in the introduction, to incorporate more people so that they are able to raise their IQs, they are able to raise their knowledge understanding, they are able to raise their praxis and their practice. So emerging technologies and technology companies creating more around public interest and public sector increasingly expected to provide technological agile services. So right now, the government has been considered as an innovator. I mean, who would have thought that? Government as innovator, but they need private sector help. There needs to be some cohesion between the public and the private. And friends, these are some of my examples about why we need public interest technology. Here, I'm showing someone who is coping perhaps with depression. The mental health crisis, predominantly at the moment, has been spurred on by COVID. In the States, one in four students aged between 18 and 24 have had suicidal ideation in the last 60 days. That number is too big. And we have to ask the question, has technology contributed to this depression? Yes, we're always socially connected, but how does that make us feel when we are not meeting in the flesh and embracing? And so are there technologies that we could create to help in well-being? Okay, if someone has been on the internet too long, if someone has been using their mobile phone too long. And there are examples in the market of these kinds of apps, and usually they're free to download. The question of homelessness. The question of human trafficking or the abuse of women. The question of dumping in countries like Bangladesh or Nepal. And poverty. Here's a young boy looking for things he can sell, going through the scraps in every single bag. Refugees. children living in squalor. If we want to be real as engineers, this is part of the issue. And so we've got people in society with disability. How can we use our mindfulness and our resources to build for people who cannot afford an extra limb, for example, or an exoskeleton? What about people with dementia? There are many people in India living with dementia. These are the real problems, friends. Not the next version of the Apple, you know, operating system. 
or in this case the Android. These are the questions. When someone doesn't know where their bed is or how to turn off the lights or turn on the lights or they can't remember whether they took their pills or not, whether this is their family, they can't even remember their own name. What are the technologies we can strive towards to help someone perhaps who's living with dementia? And so what I don't want is for us as IEEE members to keep producing what I call like drones. Same workers, same companies, same technologies, right? We're just copies of each other. No, we have to break this. We have to be individual. Individual in what? I don't mean me, 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 me. I mean individual in creativity and come together in groups like the one that you've got in the student branch to say what can we impact for change? And I, I hate to shock you, but the biggest changes you make may not necessarily require a single line of code. I'm sorry to say that to you. It's a shock, I'm sure. But it will require an integration effort of some sort. It will require the acknowledgement of socio-technical issues. You will be faced as technologists with social crises and with engaging communities to say, now, what's the best solution? How can we do this together? And so I'm going to repeat this. The greatest changes you affect locally may not require a single line of code. What it does require is your innovative thinking, the creativity you learned through your STEM degrees, and the ability to solve problems that you learned through your STEM degrees. And much of this may well be a systems integration effort. And so we don't want to become slaves to the machines. We need to build for our community. Remember going back to the Central Haryana University motto. Remember your roots. Our roots didn't have machines, friends. They had techniques like the will that moved to move things, the ability to build a bridge. Yes, you need machines to build bridges today, and we do that very well, especially underground bridges. But I want you to think beyond. How do we harness technology for good, for public interest? And what is technology? I know what many of the big companies have led us to believe what technology is, but what is technology? And so I'm going to say this to you. The most important thing in life is to seek things like human kindness or to be kind. It's to hold people's hands. This doesn't cost money. This is not technology. It's to listen to each other. Listen to someone who's in need. What are your needs? What are your needs? How can I help you? As a community, how can we help students in our own university who may be struggling? So the beginning is really about listening. It's not about creating lines of code. But it is, while you're listening, to be thinking, what, what could be a solution here? You see, an embrace doesn't cost you money. And this is where the public interest is very important because when we are talking about mental health problems, the mental health crisis cripples our workforce. It doesn't allow our workforce to perform to its best of its ability. Okay? So all of these things are so linked. If we can have better well-being where we are, and I can tell because I visited India so many times in the past, that Indian people in their hearts have a joy for life, whether it's the poorest person in, the, in, in India or the richest. And I would say some of the happiest people are not the people with resources. They're free of those uh, big salaries and the like. It is about love, loving your community, loving your place, loving the place you were born in, loving the adjoining community, coordinating with other students in other IEEE branches and doing something. This is when people come together to action something. We are not advocates, we are actionists in PIT, in public interest technology. We action things, we do things, we're useful to others and we're useful to our families and friends. We understand diversity and we understand the importance of growth. And so with that slide, I ask you now, What's next? How have you understood this talk that I have presented to you? And what are some of the questions you might have in a discussion, perhaps, if we have time? Thank you very much, ma'am. So, audience, please ask their doubts.
if anyone has any query related to this session they may ask ma'am now okay so seems like no one has any problem they all understood what uh, you taught us so thank you very much ma'am and this golden opportunity gave us so much of valuable and practically applicable and implementable information we noticed most of our participants could not join because of chhat puja festival which is a grand festival in india yes so i gulam moinuddin on behalf of our university i triple e students branch all the organizers faculties participants would like to thank our honorable speaker professor katina michael ma'am Uh, from the depth of our hearts for those mind provoking advisory words and blessing us with her presence by taking out her precious time from her busy schedule i would also like to thank our uh, branch counselor dr kalpana chauhan ma'am uh, for all the support i am also thankful to our patron professor rc kohart sir all the faculty members dean of society central university of haryana dr ajay kumar bansal sir dr डॉक्टर राजेश कुमार दुबे सर डॉक्टर राकेश कुमार सर डॉक्टर मनीष कुमार सर डॉक्टर सुमित साइनी सर डॉक्टर मुनीष मानस सर डॉक्टर मुरलीधर नायक भोग्य सर एंड ऑल द अदर टीचर्स ऑल द ऑर्गेनाइजर्स वंस अगेन कल्पना चौहान मैम एंड मिस्टर अक्षत खान हु इज द चेयरपर्सन ऑफ आई ट्रिपल ई स्टूडेंट्स ब्रांच फॉर देयर अट मोस्ट हार्ड वर्क फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस इवेंट लास्ट बट नॉट द least my thanks also goes to each and everyone who is a part of this event and who has contributed to this event directly or indirectly for uh, and also for making this event possible thank you i just wanted to say thank you for blessing me also and happy festival day uh i hope this inspires you to be at one with uh that which is dear to your hearts thank you so much thank you very much ma'am Bye friends bye bye So all of you please fill the feedback feedback form it is very important